Cornwall is so lucky to have such amazing natural capital down here. We've got the potential for floating offshore wind, we've got the potential for geothermal energy, we've got the potential to produce lithium. We're known for our fabulous geography, our geology, our communities, but they're all under threat. The natural environment requires more than simple protection at this point. We really need to actively grow those assets. There will be radical change either because of coastal erosion or sea level rise or storm surges. Loss is inevitable. Our geography means that it matters. Our values mean that it matters. We are the breakwater and the break weather for the United Kingdom. Having a world-class leading organisation to look at ways within which that we can develop and grow in a more sustainable way is fantastic. We're a community of about 200 people centred on 30 scientists all working together to find new ideas and solutions to our environmental crisis. It was really a partnership between the region and the university to attain its aspirations, managing, maintaining and improving its natural environment. One of the great things about ESI is that we've got lots of different research expertise. We have microbiologists, geologists, geographers, ecologists, mathematicians, engineers and social scientists all working together. We do fundamental research, we do device level research and applied level research. Research is always about dialogue with practitioners and with people on the ground. What's essential is we work in partnership with the people who can deliver across a very large scale. Cornwall is at the forefront of new policy and practice around sustainability. The council was one of the first to declare a climate emergency. It also pioneered an environmental growth strategy that means we've put biodiversity at the heart of policy and practice in Cornwall. The strategy sets out almost a triangle of need. Everything is based upon environment, economy above and beyond that society. It is informed by the best available scientific evidence. If we can start implementing some of the plans of that, we can overturn biodiversity decline in Cornwall. So there's a budget, there's a determination across the organisation that's led right from the top so that we really will achieve uh, net zero by 2030. Cornwall Wildlife Trust and the Cornwall Birdwatching Preservation Society bought this ex-dairy farm about 20 years ago. We've spent the last 20 years improving the site and bringing it from being a dairy farm into what's now a really good nature reserve. The target that's shared with the university and the council is to have around 30% of land and sea managed for nature's recovery and it's only if we achieve somewhere close to that that we will see the decline in nature reversed. Monitoring biodiversity is the only proper means that one can get a sense of what's happening to nature. Conservation resources are finite and we need to know how to target those. One of the key things is that everyone's got to do their little part. We bring our citizen science alongside peer-reviewed science to make the most of all that rich information that's available to us. Making space for nature has really simple, clear goals. Increase biodiversity in urban green space, bring that nature to our doorstep, and to invite people in to come and enjoy it. What we're trying to do at these sites is make them better for nature and for people. And in that way, potentially, we can get a transformation at a very large scale. We work with Dr. Ros Shaw, our impact fellow, and she checks out the change in the ecology of these sites and guides us through measuring social change. And we're very pleased to find out that, that people are valuing the nature that's coming to their doorstep. We're bringing our research to showcase it at sites like this, and that means we can communicate it both to the general public and communities. We can work with students around these sites and help them to understand urban ecology, but we can also work with policy makers. Cornish Lithium's ethos is all about responsible mineral extraction and exploration. This close working relationship with a lot of the researchers at the ASI gives us access to you know, the forefront of innovation in these fields that's key, and we're trying to translate that into our kind of daily activities. They hire uh, graduates from the Camborne School of Mines and they also sponsor research projects for our master's students. Both mining companies and governments and universities are very interested in developing policies around promoting sustainable mining. That's brought investment into the county, it's brought 
new interest in, in doing geology again and looking for mines, which we've kind of lost in this country for a long time. And I think it's encouraged other businesses to get involved with university, both in research and teaching and outreach events. So I suppose you could say the university is doing the underpinning research and hopefully that will be taken up and used and have impact in the future. We set up Bellman is everything methane, about storing liquid methane primarily, which has been refined from biomethane, biogas. And we needed somewhere where we could do our R&D. So we're working here on the Energy Independent Farm, which is a European Regional Development Fund. You have this uh, biogas processing system being installed in a rural site that has a very limited connection to the grid. And we're looking at what renewable energy you could install to kind of complement the systems. What essentially we are doing is the modelling solar resources, modelling the wind resources. I help them to understand the supply chain embedded carbon in their products so that they can make the final product less carbon intensive. Working with the university has been absolutely key for us because there's a lot of moving parts, it's a very complicated project. There will soon be a wind turbine, solar array, methane generator, battery backup, which will be used to process the gas processing equipment. Next year, this farm should be off grid, effectively negative carbon because we're capturing massive amounts of fugitive methane that would otherwise get into the environment. This project will lead to a model that we can then export to other farms and in doing so have a negative carbon footprint, so the positive. Historic England and the University of Exeter have come together in the form of a collaborative doctoral partnership to help understand the risks associated with coastal erosion and ways of mitigating the damage that it can cause to important heritage sites like this. Heritage is such a great vehicle really for talking about climate change and many of the issues that are going on right now is that heritage practitioners really have this long view of human involvement with the environment and that can really inform what we do into the future. So what I'm doing is looking at how heritage loss can be better communicated not only within the heritage sector itself but also outwards to the wider public. In a general way we tend to think that heritage is about protection and preservation that actually a lot of the stuff that happens at the coalface is much more about managing change. Projects like Tanya's actually give us the tools that we need to have those difficult conversations about change. We're going to be having this conversation for a long time and we need to be really open and iterative about it. We've been looking at sustainable development using a model called Donut Economics, which was developed by Kate Rayworth. And it looks at sustainable development as the idea that you need to bring everybody above a social foundation, so meeting people's basic needs. But in doing so, you also need to stay within the environmental ceilings. So in, in applying this model to Cornwall, we worked with the council to identify what might be the appropriate kind of indicators to measure these different social domains and also the different environmental domains. We had this fantastic public response to a big listening project over the summer. People told us that they wanted change and the Cornwall Plan is a, is a response to the hopes and aspirations that we heard. In the work we've done, we've published two reports which outline, first of all, the indicators at a county-wide level and secondly, exploring the more in-depth local level with town and parish councils. And, and those reports, the first one in particular, has gone on to underpin some of the policies that have been developed by the Cornwall and Isles of Scilly Leadership Board. Cornwall Council has set up an alliance of local authorities called Britain's leading edge and they're finding ways in which investment in natural capital in these peripheral parts of England can contribute to the wealth of the nation. Having an academic partner such as the ESI working with us is really important as we think about the challenges and opportunities of the future. It's that kind of academic weight that can speak strongly to governments when it's thinking about the future industrial strategy and the future of the country. The ESI have this amazing ability to actually bring disparate groups together. It has such knock-on benefits for the entirety of Cornwall. Our relationship with the ESI has grown from, from strength to strength and that partnership is really paving the way for some great data, great practical changes on the ground and a real difference that will have a legacy.